Mink Stoll, who needs no introduction, welcome to Cultural Attaché. Well, thank you so much for having me, Craig. Uh, I want to start by asking you about the Bible, because the Bible is filled with, with all kinds of warnings about worshiping idols, yet you, <laughs> and, Peach, you and Peaches Christ are going on, a, on the road in a show called Idol Worship. So is it fair to assume that this show is going to be biblical? Absolutely. We're coming out. I'm going to be wearing togas and Joshua is coming as a camel. No, I'm <laughs> no. Uh, no, it has nothing to do with it. I know, no. I know. No. I meant biblical, like a biblical amount of fun, biblical amount of joy. No, actually, I am the idol in the idol of, of the idol worship show. This is Joshua's fault. He, he brought this all together and... Uh, apparently I am one of his idols. So he thought this would be fun. Well, th there are worse things to be called, aren't there? There certainly are. I have to say, it's a, I feel a bit of a heavy responsibility being an idol, that if I ever make a mistake or do anything that displeases him, I will be tossed from my pedestal and shattered to the ground. But I don't think that's going to happen. We're really good friends. Well, yeah, you've you've known Joshua for quite some time. I mean, you were quite the officiant at his wedding. Um, you know, the two of you performed together for many, many years. We what, have, surpri yeah. what surprises you most about your onstage relationship with his alter ego, Peaches Christ, and how has that evolved over time? Well, well, I met him as Peaches Christ. I, I and here's we get into trouble here because I will forget sometimes when we are on stage together and and. and and I'm on stage with Peaches and I will call Peaches him and Peaches is a she, but Joshua is a him and it becomes, you know, kind of gender pronoun confusion. Uh, although Peaches, Joshua is not nine, Joshua is not non-binary. Joshua is he and Peaches is she and, you know, but I just forget sometimes. Um, so I met Joshua, I met Peaches. I never, I didn't meet Joshua, I met Peaches. And it was an amazing first meeting because he invited me to come up uh, to be uh, a guest at his midnight mass show in San Francisco. This was about 20 years ago. Neither of us can remember the exact date, but it was about 20 years ago, 20 some years. And I had never met him, didn't know who he was, but I thought, sure, why not? I'll come and, and it'll be fun. And I came into the theater and he had done such an amazing job of making me feel welcome. There was a huge banner at the back of the stage saying, hail mink. And, you know, I he gave me a bouquet of flowers and there was an animatronic Peggy Gravel on the stage stirring a vat of rabies potion. You know, they were showing desperate living. And I was so impressed by the effort that he had put in to make me feel good that I, you know, completely fell in love with him and nothing that he has done since then has made me feel any different. Now the reality behind that is that there are countless people who feel just as passionately as he does about the work that you've done, you know, over the many over the many decades. He just happens to have, you know, the the, you know, ability to express it in ways that maybe others can't. But, you know, if we're going to talk about idols, you do realize you you are idolized by millions of people uh, I, that makes me feel just ever so slightly uh, uncomfortable i have to admit it's lovely it's wonderful but it, it's it's like i said it's too easy to topple idols topple and so putting that on my shoulders is kind of it's a big it's a lot but thank you <laughs> well and you couldn't have imagined that this that this Never. This million. kind of response would ever develop, could you? Never in a million years. And also, you know, the reality is that when I was first, you know, first working with John, all of the attention or the bulk, the huge bulk of the attention was going to Divine. So, I mean, I remember interviews where I would be there with Divine and John, and I would not be asked one single question, you know, and I would sit there. <clears throat> You know, and keeping a smile on my face, pretending like that was fine. And so I wasn't accustomed to being the one in the spotlight. I was always accustomed to being over there in the corner. Not unvalued, but not lionized, not idolized. So it did come as a big shock to me when, when Joshua did this for me. 
And I, I admit it's very gratifying. It's really, it's lovely, but it's not something I ever expected. Right. Now, how do you, how do you think your relationship with Joshua and with Peaches has evolved over the two decades that you've known each other? Well, it's just gotten better. We, you know, we, we started just, I would appear a couple of, you know, I appeared a couple of times at Midnight Mass and we would just do interviews. And then I did, uh, he asked me to be in his movie, All About Evil, which, I mean, I said yes before I even saw the script. You know, I already trusted him. You know, all of my dealings with him had been incredibly good. So I felt, I felt completely safe. So I said, yes, and I'm really happy I did. I had a great time making that movie and I really like the movie. You've seen it? Yes, I have. Well, I... it is probably, I was tortured more in that movie than John Waters ever tortured me. So it was fun. And, but that was a wonderful experience. And then I've done some stage shows with him. He, he, he wrote a wonderful show called Return to Grey Gardens with Jinx Monsoon, which is so much fun. And he asked me to be a part of that. So I've done a couple of those. We've done that in, um, oh, I see, we did it in New York. We did it in San Francisco. We did it in Seattle. So we've traveled together many times. We just really get along really well. It's, we have a good time together. And that's a nice thing to say about somebody because it makes the work that much easier and more satisfying, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so we're not looking at each other. We're encouraging each other. Right, right. Now, for people who who know drag primarily through RuPaul's Drag Race, you know, you constantly hear the queens talk about how their drag persona allows them to take on a fuller representation of who they are, that it allows them to do things that being just their, you know, street persona doesn't allow them to do. Does the same thing apply to, to Joshua? And does does Peaches, does Peaches give Joshua a chance to do things that Joshua wouldn't? Well, probably, but that's a question for Joshua and Peaches. That's not really a question for me, but I will say that any role that you take on gives you a chance to do something that you don't do in your normal life. I mean, Connie Marble, I loved Connie Marble. I loved playing her. She is not somebody I would want to be with. So, you know, you, you always get a chance to be something else when you take on a role. So drag is a role. Drag is a persona and it's something that you do put on. So I think, uh, but as far as actual specifics on in Peach's case, I really don't have the answer to that. I am completely comfortable with Peaches as Peaches and with Joshua as Joshua. I have no problem differentiating between them or being with either of them. Right, now I, I interviewed Joshua as Peaches in 2019. Um, when he was doing one of his stage parodies here in Los Angeles. I think it was the first time um, one of the stage parodies was was being done in Los Angeles because he was afraid of what how Los Angeles would take a parody of Mean Girls because it was <laughs> Hollywood and it takes itself so seriously and everything like that. And when discussing the show, you know, Peach has said, we actually find that when the show is flawless, it's not as fun. Do you share that that? Uh, opinion I, I kind of do. I kind of do. And in the show that we're doing in Idol Worship, we don't script it. We, you know, we have an outline. We have a, a, a roadmap to where we're going to go. But there's always room for a little side trip. There's always room for spontaneity. And the uh, the idea, the problem when you super script something is that people get so embedded in the script that if they lose their place, they don't know where they are. They have no chance of, of getting back and they're thrown and they're desperate. And then you see uncomfort on, you know, you see them being uncomfortable on the stage. And that always make, the, makes the audience so uncomfortable. So we have built, we're, we're mistake proof because we're not afraid of mistakes. And we're not afraid of going, oh, didn't mean that what I really meant to say was this. We're, that's fine. You know, we're just being our, I can't say we're being completely ourselves. I mean, we're being heightened, our heightened selves because we're on stage in front of an audience, but we're as ourselves as we can be. You know, right. We're not, we're not taking on a persona. Well, Joshua, right. I guess. I just <laughs> 
Isn't Peaches isn't, but Joshua is, but Joshua isn't on stage. Peaches is. Peaches is, yes. Right. Well, it sounds but like. Still on stage with the Joshua that I know and love. So it's, you know, we're, we're safe. Uh, absolutely. Well, it sounds like the show that you're doing allows you to be like jazz musicians. You can just improv and riff however you want. Pretty much. I mean, we, we have, you know, we do songs. Joshua opens with a song, then I come in with a song. We do a couple of duets. Um, and you know, and we have conversation and film clips. There's a lot of film clips. He's put together an amazing film clip reel or reels. I've seen some of it and it's kind of great. Uh, I mean, I forget sometimes what I have done, you know, and then I see, and then I see Connie next to Taffy, next to Peggy next. And it's like, oh, I did that. So it's, it's really interesting for me. It, it puts, Joshua puts my career and my work into a completely different perspective for me, which is really very interesting. And and when you when you first saw any of those collections of of uh, film clips, what were your first thoughts about what you had accomplished? I, like I just said, I did that. That's me. I did that because you have to remember the movies were years apart. You know, so there was. Peggy, I mean, there was, you know, Connie, and then there was Taffy, but, you know, years were in between. So it, it's seeing them jammed up next to each other that's so impressive to me. And then I'm very proud, actually. I have to admit that I'm very, I, I'm very proud of it, and I'm very gratifying. Um, now, was I, all humility. Of please. course. Now, was Peaches able to find any, any, you know, lost footage of you as Auntie M from The Wizard of Odd or Nobody. the Kansas City pothead? He might have it somewhere. I've never asked him. It's not, you know, there's a, there's a, the Academy Museum here in LA has a museum show about John and, you know, the work that we've done. And there's no footage there. So I think if it existed, they would have it. Right. Well, since you brought up the Academy exhibit, um, it wasn't that long ago, it was five, a little over five years ago, five and a half years ago, that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences held a big 30th anniversary screening of Hairspray at the Sam Goldwyn Theater. And then, of course, you just referenced the Pope of Trash, which is the exhibit at the Academy Museum right now, yeah. dedicated to John Waters' career yeah. and work. What do you see as the reasons, perhaps, and the changes that have taken place, both in the world and in the way this work has been accepted and embraced by the industry's most formalized institution? I don't know. To tell you the truth, it baffles me. I mean, this is stuff that was reviled when we did it. You know, 50 years ago or over 50 years ago now that we did Pink Flamingos, we were reviled. People hated us. Not everybody, but enough, you know, but the mainstream press and the mainstream cinema world, they hated us. And so uh, it was through John's absolute dedication to what he had done. I mean, he worked really hard. I can't give you the details. You would have to get them from John, but he pushed. He went out, I mean, he shopped the movie. He went out and pushed and pushed and pushed until it found a home in the midnight world. So uh, it could easily, you know, had he not been so ambitious and so determined, it could easily have just been forgotten. It could easily have had a couple of screenings in Baltimore and then just been and disappeared. So uh, I think part of it is that John has proven himself to be so charming. He is so smart. Uh, he's really a brilliant man and he's, and he's charming and he's funny. And I think John himself has basically charmed the, uh, the opposition. Of course, Hairspray helped. Right, you know, but you know the interesting thing is sometimes people are just ahead of their ahead of their time. I mean, Philip people didn't understand Philip Glass when he started. Stephen Sondheim's true. musicals didn't get recognized. It's equally plausible that John Waters was just as much at the forefront of a new way of doing things that people just didn't understand, and it took them a while to catch up. Well, that's also very possible, but and I, I mean I think that's true, but I mean there were other people who were working in odd genre. I don't know that there was anybody doing, there was nobody doing exactly what we were doing, but there were other people who were working in, you know, what they called underground films back then. 
Uh, but John was the one who really pushed. I, I don't think I've ever known anybody with as much ambition and drive as John. And it's funny because we, we all watch from afar and just go, it just, it's all, it must seem effortless. It's not. Of course. He works so hard. He works really, really hard. And when you, when you think about it, uh, you know, you go back to the early films, he, he not only wrote them and directed them, he, he got the money for them. He was, he was doing all the work. He was the teamster. He drove around and picked us all up from our parents' houses and drove us to the set. And then at the end of the day, would drive everybody home again. You know, I mean, he did all the jobs. So, you know, I mean, he really knows. I mean, he really wanted to do it. And we're all going, yay, this is really great. This is really fun. And we worked hard. You know, we were, um, I used to get very upset when people would call us amateurs or non-professionals. And I would say, yes, we are untrained, but we are not unprofessional. We are very professional. We show up on time, we know our lines. We're not drunk, we're not stoned. And we do the scene generally in one take. And that's professional. It is, it is. What else is also is professional is your singing. I mean, when I heard, when I heard Do, Re, Mink, I was just going, where has this album been? Why didn't, <laughs> you know, so... So when, if you're doing music as part of these shows, will, will this be new songs that you're doing or, or no, this, album? Well, a couple, there, there'll be a couple, there, we're doing one or two new things, but um, some of it, I'm, I'm doing a couple songs from the album as well. So um, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, a couple songs from the album. I'm gonna do Bang Bang, which is one of my favorites from the album. Cause yeah. I love singing in French. <laughs> my favorite actually was Baltimore because A, I'm I love, cool. I love that song. I've always Thanks. loved Randy Newman. But, you know, for someone from Baltimore to sing it just felt, you know, well, thank you. perfect. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing Terrific. that. Terrific. Now, since we've, since we've mentioned Mr. Waters a couple of times, I have a question on behalf of one of the readers of Cultural Attaché, um, which is, uh, his name is Joshua Schwartz, and he regularly attends the John Waters camp. And he, oh. he, he, cur he was curious, what are the highlights for you of attending that camp each year? <laughs> well... I love being there. This is a camp. I mean, I don't, it, it's out in the country. It's in Kent, Connecticut. It's, it's, it's completely isolated and it is filled with nutsos. I mean, these people are fanatic. They have tattoos of John's signature. They have my picture on their legs. They have, these are people who are so intensely, such intense fans and they have created a family. There are people who go every year to, you know, and they just come back because this is where their friends come. This is where they convene. It's like, it's a convention out in the woods. They can, they can drink, they can take drugs. They can do, you know, they can completely leave their lives behind and be just in the world of their John Waters friends and fans. And I think it's amazing. I thought when I first heard about it, I thought it was insane. I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard. Nobody would possibly want to do that. And hundreds of people come every year. So there is something really, I mean, just walking into the room and feeling this intense amount of love from all of these people. They love us. And I love them back. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a happy place. It, so you get you get your summer fix of idol worship as well. I do, I do. I and it, it's just enough. I'm usually there. I'm there on Friday night and Saturday, and then I disappear. And there are other, you know, somebody else comes in on Sunday. You know, Saturday night and Sunday, other people come in. But it, it's it's just enough for me. But I do love it. It's it really is. It's I feel like I'm being washed. I'm being bathed in this uh, glow of love, and it's really kind of amazing and you know like i said it's gratifying and wonderful but i like it in that intense concentration of the camp rather than having it you know constantly in my life that would be difficult yeah of course of course i think that would be difficult for anybody that would be suffocating it would be um in the same interview that i did with peaches you know i asked her um about 
secrets that might be held in her hair. It was a reference to a line from from Mean Girls. Uh, oh, okay. And the response, you know, said, I've got a lot of secrets tucked inside this big wig of mine. I've become friends with Elvira, and I know a lot about Cassandra, Mink Stoll, John Waters. They aren't secrets, but things you keep quiet. Whatever could Peaches have been talking about as it relates to you? No, 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 no. <laughs> they are secrets for a reason there's there's nothing dark there's no murders in our background there you know we there's there's nothing like that but um we do one of the reasons that we have stayed friends is because we do respect the confidences of course and i wasn't really probing to get into the secrets that was more just a yes, you were. <laughs> no i wasn't if I... I had been willing to give you one you would have been happy <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing there's there's really nothing right you know you know we but as we're friends we do talk and we'll talk about this gets on my nerves or that gets on my nerves and uh, ugh, which isn't really interesting to the world at large and no different than anybody else's relationship exactly. with their friends exactly. you know that's that's sort of what i'm trying to get at is is to demystify some of this stuff at the same yeah. time it's it's just friend talk it's just babble and chatter right and Sometimes we vent, of course. You know, but that's what friends do, and that's what that's what being friends is about. So, but the venting, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in the vent room stays in the vent room. It's just kind of that sort of thing. Of course, of course. Um, I read an interview that you did in 2013 with Logan Lynn that was published on Huff Post. It was around the time of Jeffrey Schwartz's documentary about Divine. Yeah. Um, and Logan asked you about Roman candles. And at the time you couldn't remember if divine was in it or not. Yes. And, and divine is, yes, and yeah. Logan said, you have to fully rely on the real in your head. And what I loved most was your response when he said that, because you said exactly. And it's full of scratches and splice marks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember saying that, but that's good. I like that. That is good. So, you know, over 10 years later, how is the real in your head? It's more scratched and more spliced together than ever. I mean, one of the reasons people ask me if I'm going to write a book, if I'm going to do memoirs, and I really can't because I didn't take notes. So, you know, I can see film clips and I can remember certain things, but the minutia of my life that might be interesting, I, it's gone. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a well into my senior years now. So it's, Except there's only one way that I could possibly do it. And I've said this before. If, if I had lots and lots and lots of marijuana gummies and somebody to walk around writing down every word I said as I muttered to myself. <laughs> well, I guess that you, it's like that old adage that came out, you know, I guess, sometime in the, in the 2000s. You know, if, there, if you remember the 80s, you weren't having fun. Exactly. exactly. Probably two of the <laughs> 70s as well. And the 60s. Yeah, of course. I was around for part of the 60s, so I, you know, but I was much younger. I wasn't having that kind of fun until later. Well, I mean, I turned 13 in 1960. So, you know, I, I am definitely, a, I, my whole teenage years were the 60s. Right. Which I think would be fun. I think it'd be yeah. a great time to be a teenager. It was a great time. Well, it wasn't so great to be a, high school wasn't great, but after high school, I mean, I, I met John when I was 19. Uh, 18 actually turning 19 right so from that point on things got better much much more interesting right the last thing I want to ask you about Mink is you know you've worked with with John Waters rather famously with Divine the work that you're doing with Peaches Christ but a lot of people don't know that you were off Broadway working with Charles Ludlam in the early 80s yeah That's that really a great time Really a great time. And the thing that all these people have in common is they are not afraid to be unapologetically themselves. And in the case of, of John and Charles Ludlum and Divine, that was certainly at a time when it was not okay to do that. You faced a lot, you, a lot of risk and a lot of condemnation if you did so. It seems like we're back in the time where being your authentic self is still a problem, particularly if you're gay or if you do drag. What are your thoughts are about where we are today and what is your hope for where we will end up? Well, I'm actually really surprised at the backlash, at the gay backlash. I really thought that when RuPaul came out with, with Drag Race, 
that drag was going to the mainstream. I was perfect. I was so I was really happy with things like drag queen story hour and drag brunches and stuff because it's it's just performance. That's all it is. It's performance. It's fun. People enjoy it. And you know, kids. I have known small. I have known nine year old boys and ten year old boys who dressed in drag. Doesn't mean they want to be girls. It just means they want to dress in drag. And there is no such. I mean, there's such a thing as grooming for nefarious purposes, but you cannot groom somebody to be gay. You're either gay or you're not gay, or you're bi or you're this or you're that, but you can't be taught it. You can be exposed to it, but you can't be taught it. You can't be changed. So this, but I was very happy with the drag race and, and the fact that everybody knows a drag queen now. And now suddenly it's, you know, drag queens are ruining the world. You know, the, the earth is going to shatter if a child sees a drag queen. And I find that really difficult uh, to deal with. I don't understand it. And um, what I hope, I don't wanna to get too political, but I, I hope that there's going to be a backlash to the backlash and that young people are going to see what's going on and they're gonna say, this is not acceptable. We want exposure. We don't want books being banned. We, don't, we want to be able to read things. We want to be able to see things and they will start voting to make sure that that happens. And that means voting locally. That means voting for school board president. And you know, I mean, it means not just paying attention to major elections, but the little ones as well. So I'm not gonna mention names, but well, the there irony are a lot, is a lot of people out there who don't want other people to be happy. Right. And and the irony, as you as you were saying that you can't you can't be taught to be gay. You can be taught to be a bigot. You can be. Yes, you can be. You can. And people are. Right. That's that's, you know, why there's that song in South Pacific. You have to be carefully taught. Yes. You know, yeah, you taught to be a bigot. You can be taught to hate. You can, and that's unfortunate. And there are, there are people who in the name of whatever religion they, they practice, think that they have the right to tell other people what to do. So like I said, I'm hoping for the backlash to the backlash and that there'll be a flip. I'm, I'm optimistic, cautiously. Well, you know, I think as long as people get to see you and Peaches Christ on stage, you know, over the next week and a half, as as you discuss the joys of being you and having your career, that'll help melt a lot of that away. Laughter takes a lot of pain away. Yes. So any if, if people coming to see us helps the political landscape of the country, that would be a really nice bonus. It would yeah. be. But I do think people need to get out there, yes, and be themselves. So, yeah. They do, and you, we wouldn't be having this conversation if you hadn't done the very same thing. You know, when I got started, people, here's the one thing that my caveat to be yourself is when you're growing up, I didn't know who that was. People would say, be yourself. And I was like, I don't know who that is. Am I this or am I that? And, you know, you're an awkward kid, you're an awkward teenager. So am I this awkward person? Is there a, is there a butterfly inside this cocoon? I don't know. I was really lucky because I found a way, you know, I lucked into a world that encouraged me to express myself and to figure out who myself was and to explore the options. I was very lucky. So I wish that luck for everybody. Not everybody's gonna meet a John Waters. That's an extraordinary piece of luck. But, you know, I do, you know, I want people to be able to get out and read and play. People have to play. They absolutely do. Mink, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm sorry the show's not coming to Los Angeles because I'm not going to be able to travel to see it, but maybe someday I'll, you know. Perhaps, what I'm perhaps someday. And this was a real treat, Craig. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Safe travels on the road.